uh, board members and members of the public. Uh, thank you for joining me today, uh, joining us at the Board of Community Services. My name is Logan Pitts. I'm the incoming chair of the Board of Community Services. We also have uh, board members Terry Griffin here today with us, Steve Spillman, Carolina Spence, Caroline Quant, and uh, Carol Quant, excuse me, Guido Bocalioni, and Madonna Cruz. Uh, anyone, please let me know if I'm not uh, pronouncing your name correctly. Everyone deserves to be called what they want, uh, so please let me know. Um, and uh, we're going to move on to. Uh, the introduction of our host, which is Shelly McClure and Jackie uh, Haman. Again, Jackie, let me know if I'm not saying that right. Um, they will be coordinating all of our comments from the public and assisting during the meeting and taking any follow-up notes. Uh, so panelists and presenters, I'd ask you to please silence your cell phones and keep microphones muted if not speaking. Members of the public joining this meeting will have webcams off and microphones muted. If you're phoning in to join the meeting and you choose to speak during the public comments portion of the agenda, for privacy concerns, the host will rename you to caller and only show the last four digits of your phone number. And the city of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment for everyone uh, free from disruption. We will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone's expected to participate respectfully or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. Let's be nice to each other. Host, will you please explain how comments will be heard at today's meeting? Thank you, Chair Pitts. At each agenda item, the item will be presented and the chair will ask for board comments or questions and then at the appropriate time, open the floor for public comments. The host will lower all hands until the public comment item is open. Once the chair has called for public comment, the chair will ask the public to raise their hand if they wish to speak on a specific agenda item. Those joining by phone may dial star nine to raise your hand. The host will then call on those who've raised their hands. The public comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Emailed public comments have been received that have been received by the deadline have been distributed to the board of community service members and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received will not be read into the record. Great, thank you, Shelley. So with that, I call this February 23rd, 2022 meeting of the Board of Community Services to order at 4.15 p.m. And I also will bang that in uh, with, with the ceremonial gavel that the mayor was so nice to give me. There we go. We're in a meeting. Um, and I also need to read uh, a little note pursuant to government code section 54953E and the recommendation of the health officer of the county of Sonoma, board of community service members will be participating in today's meeting via Zoom webinar as we're doing now. Board members and staff are participating from our remote locations and we're practicing appropriate social distancing. Members of the public may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and on the agenda. Uh, host, may we have a roll call? Please respond when I call your name. Chair Pitts? Yes. Vice Chair Griffin? Here. Board Member Spillman? Yes. Board Member Quant? Here. Board Member Cruz? Here. Board Member Spence? Here. Board Member Bocalioni? Here. Let the record reflect that all board members are present. Great. And I just, uh, we're going to go to public comments now. Uh, so I'd like to open the floor for public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, this is the time when any person may address the board on matters not listed on this agenda, but are within the subject matter of our jurisdiction. Uh, host, do we have any public comment items? Yes, we have two speakers at this time. Uh, thank you. Please call the first speaker. Thank you. John, I am going to uh, unmute you. Please go ahead with your comments. Hi, my name is John Quinn. I'm the president of Santa Rosa Youth Soccer League. We have about 2,500 youth uh, playing soccer in our community, in our league. Um, in addition to our league, there's probably another 1,500 or 2,000 kids playing soccer. 
the state of the field in our city is terrible. Um, they are overused and under maintained for the level of use that, that the fields uh, experience. Somehow we need to solve this problem by creating more fields or putting artificial turf on fields, uh, adding lights to the artificial turf field so they can be used into the evening. Uh, but the practice for many years has been inadequate for the needs of the community. Our fields are in such bad shape that when we play in higher level leagues, we are not able to play any home games on our city fields. They are not of adequate quality by any objective standard. Uh, so I think there's got to be a better program to fertilize them, to water them, to roll them, to top dress them, to overseed them, and to deal with the weed abatement. As a general matter, my understanding is the, the city aspires to cut the fields at a pretty long length, uh, three inches was their historic spec. That's awfully long for little kids to be playing uh, field games, uh, field sports. And, uh, you know, I think we need to evaluate changing our variety of seeds that we use to facilitate mowing the fields shorter to make them more playable for our, our community. It, these are long-term problems and it's gonna be a long-term fix, but I think, you know, there's no better time than the present to start working on this because I've been involved in soccer in this community for 20 years. And for 20 years, we haven't had good fields. And we talk about it every, we come to the Board of Community Services, we come to the city council, we talk about it every, every six months and we don't see any change. Um, you know, we've helped, we as an organization have helped with the cost of maintaining fields and the labor of maintaining fields. Uh, but, you know, the general program we have to, to prepare, prepare and provide these fields to the community is inadequate for the community's needs. I, I understand Tim is gonna speak later about the maintenance program. You know, maybe he has some fresh ideas. Uh, I certainly hope so, but uh, we need to do better than we have done for the last 20 years. Uh, and with that, I would yield my remaining time. Thanks, John. Thank you. Our next speaker is Team Olenberger. Team Olenberger, if you'd like to say your name, I'm gonna unmute you. Can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, Casey Olenberger with FBK1 Baseball and Training. I'm sorry about the Team Olenberger. My wife put that up uh, as a joke. Um, so I just wanna briefly discuss um, our submission of the Doyle Park project and um, the renovation of the field. Um, as most of us know, it's the only uh, lit baseball field, I believe in the county, other than going out to Sonoma. So our goal is to fundraise in order to pay for our upgrades. Um, the upgrades that we have <laughs> new field dimensions um, that would bring, it would keep the fences as they are. We'd bring the fences in. Um, we'd we'd uh, add new fences. Um, the, the kicker is that we'd make it an all weather field. We would add new dugouts, bleachers, press box, um, bullpens and batting cages. And the bullpens and batting cages we propose would be behind the new fences that would be brought in. Once again, we'd keep the existing dimensions and just make a field within the field. Um, as we all know, listen, it's nobody's fault. We understand the city is short staffed and you know we are out there as much as possible trying to upkeep the field. With the field being closed three months a year, it makes it very difficult to stay on top of the field and keep it to where it's uh, uh, maintained and playable uh, through 12 months of the season. Um, <clears throat> in order for this to take place, our proposal is that we would fundraise the money to do so. Um, we would like to obviously partner with other nonprofits and the city in help with our effort to fundraise money 
um, to pay for this. We'd also uh, suggest that we would, uh, hopefully the city would allow money through Measure M to be a part of this project. Uh, if so, that would take a huge burden off of both the city and our shoulders uh, in order to get this project done. <clears throat> Something that I think that, uh, that, could, that could happen. Um, I think that this is a, is a place that needs to be brought back to a baseball mecca like it once was. And by doing these renovations and upgrades, I think it's something that it'll be a baseball hangout um, for families, kids, teams, organizations. Uh, we'll be able to host tournaments, CIF championships, be able to bring other teams in to practice, to work out. Of course, would love to use it for my organization. But uh, right now it's more of a hangout for the homeless. And I think with these renovations and upgrades that we can, um, uh, we can help get the homeless out. And I know that the neighborhoods would appreciate or the neighbors in the neighborhood would appreciate that. So um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And uh, that's all for now. Thank you for your comments. Do we have any more comments, Shelley? Thank you. We have no other hands at this time. Great. Our next item is the approval of minutes. Are there any edits or corrections to the minutes of January 26, 2022? Seeing no edits, I will take those as approved as submitted. Uh, Deputy Director Santos, hello. Please give your report on our upcoming and accomplished events. Thank you, Chair Pitts. And so uh, I will say that uh, it's going to be a little bit old fashioned. I have a lot to read for this section because we had a little snafu with our posting. So bear with me. I want to make sure it's part of the record. So if anybody did miss it, they, they have the information now. So <laughs> I'm going to do a bit of reading so we can know what our upcoming events are. Uh, so for February, uh, the recruiting for hiring seasonal jobs for our recreation uh, staff is happening, lifeguards, scorekeepers, camp staff, Howard Park ride operators, et cetera. So if you know anybody interested, uh, we're looking for that. Also this month, uh, in partnership with Sonoma County Library, an interactive story walk uh, at Rincon Valley Park begins uh, in late February. And uh, March 1st, Applications for Summer Work Experience Program for Teens is available. Uh, after two years, we're finally bringing this popular program back, whereby approximately 300 junior high age teens fill positions such as counselor in training, junior lifeguard, leaders in training, Howarth Park uh, aides, and many more um, opportunities are out there for our junior high age teens. Uh, we also have picnic season, be season beginning in March 1st. And so our reservations for picnics are, uh, will be starting and uh, the first rentals begin on the 1st of March. And then uh, March 1st through 30th, we have the Leprechaun Treasure Hunt in City Parks brought back for a second year by popular demand. So the hunt for a paper leprechaun um, uh, throughout the uh, City Parks and return it to Finley Community Center for a prize is happening um, March, this entire month of March 1st through 30th. And then on the 4th through the 13th of March, we have the Theater for Children uh, presents Wizard of Oz at the Steel Lane Community Center. It should be exciting. And of course, on March 5th, we have the City Sluggers T-Ball program for ages five to seven in Rencon Valley Park. And that's back after two years of not being able to do that in the pandemic. And March 13th, we have the St. Patrick's Day 5K presented by Fleet Feet Sports, which benefits the Santa Rosa and Rex Scholarship Program. And on March 14th, we have um, sport field permits for soccer begins. And we have 12 clubs representing over 3,000 players using the fields. A few more, <laughs> bear with me. We got a lot going on in spring. March 21st through 25th, we have a new spring break camp for kindergartners and first graders offered at Steel Lane Community Center. 
And the camp will include daily swimming, water safety talks, uh, and a second camp is also, also being offered for grades uh, two through six. And uh, same time, March 21st through 25th, um, Camp Watcham is back. This is held in Howarth Park for kids ages six to 12. It's a very popular and very busy camp and they've got hiking, canoeing, archery, crafts and field trips. Um, again, same time, March 21st through 25th, um, all sorts of sports spring break camps at Galvin Park in cooperation with the National Academy of Athletics for ages four to 13. And uh, March 21st through 25th, again, spring break hoop it up basketball camp for ages seven through 13 in cooperation with the National Academy of Athletics. And on March 26th, we have senior bingo at Steel Lane Community Center from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We have a variety of bingo games and lunch from uh, Chick-fil-A provided. And last but not least, uh, March 27th, we have a Santa Rosa compost giveaway at a place to play park. So that's upcoming, uh, upcoming events and accomplishments. Quite a lot. Thank you, Jen. Uh, would you like to move on to your director updates? Oh. Or are there any questions from any board members on those? Great. Please move on. All right, thank you so much, Chair. And I just wanted to take a minute to recognize and um, congratulate you for uh, being appointed as our Chair of the Board of Community Services. And many, many thanks to our former Chair, uh, Carol Quant, for filling that role very diligently. We appreciate her service and looking forward to uh, Logan, Logan stepping into this position. Uh, we also have, um, some really exciting news. Today, we opened Colgan Creek Neighborhood Park uh, Playground um, this morning. And the playground's for ages, uh, youth ages five to 12. And we had the mayor, uh, Mayor Rogers and Vice Mayor Alvarez participated in, in the unveiling this morning. And if you haven't had a chance to see this new playground, please stop by and check it out. It's really great. And we will have some information up on our website soon. There's a News flash on the on the city's website, but we'll have a little bit more information and some more pictures and hopefully a video um, on the parks website soon. And then on at council on February fifteenth, um, council approved the release of an RFP to solicit for a new operator to manage the golf course and the restaurant as one operation. So the current golf operator's contract expires July first of this year. And the plan is to have a new operator to begin service within uh, three to five days of July 1st of this year. So that RFP should be out and available for those interested in operating both the golf course and the restaurant um, starting March 1st at our purchasing bid site online. And also February 15th, uh, we have um, council member Diana McDonald participated in her first council meeting of her term which expires at the end of this year. Um, the council member was appointed by the city council to fill the vacancy in district three when council member uh, Tibbetts uh, vacated the position. And we also have, uh, I wanted to update you that staff will be embarking on an update to the ordinances and bylaws that govern the VOCS. Uh, we'll be bringing the topic uh, to a future meeting for discussion and uh, potentially creation of a subcommittee of this board to coordinate better with staff so we can really get into the details. Uh, the pro for the process, we'll be looking into, of course, correcting the amount of members from eight back down to seven. And of course, looking at aligning the ordinances and bylaws with the current and future role of our Board of Community Services. So stay tuned for that in a future uh, agenda. Um, also, if we seem really busy this month, we have been busily working on the budget, as well as all folks in the city have been working diligently to get the budget updated and moving forward. And uh, we're, we're just about finished here in parks, so um, certainly circle back with us if you're still waiting for information or need, some need to contact us. We're here, but been a little bit busy with the budget. 
Um, and last but not, not least, I wanted to um, update you all that uh, on or before March 1st, sometime between February 28th and March 1st, <laughs> Um, our uh, assistant city manager, Jason Nutt, will no longer be the transportation and public works director and the assistant city manager. Um, instead, he's been asked by the city manager to fill uh, entirely the assistant city manager position. And that will leave a vacancy in the transportation and public works director position, which will be advertised immediately. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, that position, the director position for public works will be filled on an acting basis internally by two existing employees for three month terms each. Uh, Gabe Osborne, our deputy director of development services with the planning and economic development department will fill the role for the first three months. And then Joe Schifoni, our deputy director of water and sewer operations with the water department will fill the role for the remaining three months um, uh, for the director of public works. The intention is to fill this position permanently within six months. Um, and so, we'll, you know, it does take about that long to hire some uh, somebody at the director level. We go through a big national outreach to find uh, somebody for that position. Uh, we're excited to have our two internal staff come in. We, I, you know, I work with them all the time and it should be good uh, to get some, get some work done in the next six months. Um, of course, um, our assistant city manager, Nutt, will be involved in um, things to do with recreation parks that are on more of a citywide basis and things that um, he's already been involved in, such as the golf course and Roseland Creek Community Park and, and other things like that. But um, congratulations to him for sure for, um, for moving on to the only the assistant city manager and having the to fill that um, director position. So with that, that is the end of my updates. Thank you, Jen. And uh, thank you for those nice words. I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, what I'm going to do now uh, before we jump ahead is just say a few words of my own as a little welcome as chair. Um, and first, I want to say thank you to Carol for her service as chair. Carol is uh, maybe the best volunteer the city has. She gives all so much of her time to the city. We're really fortunate to have her uh, help us out. So thank you, Carol, for your service. Um, we still need you. Um, and I just want to say a little bit about um, what I intend to do as chair. I think I'll keep this speech short. I'm sure you'll all hear me give speeches, um, but. I've talked about before how important it is to me um, that we have access to outdoors for everyone in Santa Rosa. Uh, as a renter, it's especially important to me that folks get that. I'm fortunate I, I have a backyard. Not every renter does, not every homeowner does. And I think that we need to remember that um, in a simple way, parks are everyone's front and backyard. And in a deeper way, it's what keeps us healthy. It's what keeps us together as a community. Um, they serve so many purposes. Parks make life better. Uh, and that's really important to me. And I, I know it's important to everyone else on this board. Um, on the smaller stuff, there is a few things I want to um, add on to us, on to our board. And uh, one of those is setting up city email addresses. So I've instructed the staff to, to reach out to everyone. Uh, I think that we need to be more uh, accountable to the public and that means being able being easier to reach so um i encourage you to uh, sign up for that and use it and and give it out to residents so they can get in touch with you i'm also going to look at um, changing our meeting time to 5 p.m which not everyone might love but uh, i want to align that with um a city ordinance that says public hearings need to begin after five and we don't fall under that but i think the spirit of it fits with uh, being more accountable and more accessible. Um, so I hope you're not too mad at me for those two things, um, but it's important to me that that we do those. And I also want everyone to just review uh, Rosenberg's rules again, review the Brown Act. Um, I know it's exciting reading, but it's really important that everyone knows our shared set of rules that we all operate by. That's, that's so that the public can keep us accountable and so that they can let us know how they feel. Um, and I think that I will end my speech there. Uh, and 
move on. Um, Madonna and Carol, it looks like uh, you had some comments too. Thank you. I just, with the city email, is the city gonna give us the business cards too with that information on it? That's a question for staff. Jen, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, we'll, we'll need to look at the cost and get that back to you um, so we can get everybody their correct email address and if, uh, if we can do business cards in the budget as well. Each department budget has to fund uh, the cost for the email address and the cards, so we'll get back to you. One step at a time, thank you. Carol. Yeah, yeah, this uh, city email address, is this something that's being implemented across all the boards or just something that you want to see implemented for this board uh, one step at a time? And would this be a suggested use, mandatory use? How does that work? Uh, as far as I know, it's not a standard thing across boards. The reason that I really thought of it is uh, I'm also on the Charter Review Committee and we got city email addresses for that. And it just sort of uh, made sense to me that people should be able to reach us. It's not mandatory, that's up to you to check it. I'd, I'd highly encourage you to check it regularly, um, but you know, that's, that's your choice. However you wanna communicate with the public, people of course can always come to the meeting, um, talk to you in person or, or, or whatever they wanna do. Um, so it's up to each board member, yeah. Thank you for that. Thanks, Carol, for the question. And thank you, Madonna. All right, we will move on to our scheduled items. Uh, first, we have item 7.1, our adult and youth sports program update. Recreation Supervisor Amy Rocklowitz, the floor is yours. Well, hello and good evening, everybody. Um, as Logan mentioned, my name is Amy Rocklowitz and I'm a supervisor in the recreation division. And one of the areas that I supervise is the youth and adult sports programs. Um, I don't know if it's possible, maybe Shelly can answer. I do have Greg Desmond, he's participating. I wanted to introduce him. He's our brand new sports coordinator. Um, he'll get to do this presentation next time, but for now, since he's so new, I didn't throw him into it yet. So I don't know if he can, uh, they can show his face just to introduce him. Is that possible, Shelly? Yeah, I've just moved him over as a panelist. So he should, you should be seeing him any second. Okay, thank Hello. you. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. So again, I wanted to introduce you to Greg Desmond. I'm thrilled to have him on board. He's been, the, he was worked with the department for many years as a temporary employee, mostly in aquatics, uh, but he's diving right in, <laughs> get the pun, to uh, do sports with us over here. So again, I just wanted to welcome Greg and introduce you to him. So with that, I'll get started um, on the presentation about youth and adult sports. Um, let's see, the next slide. Thank you. So I wanted to share that we are bringing youth sports back uh, for 2022 after two years of canceling all of our youth sports programs, uh, internal programs, I should say, for recreation. We're really excited to bring them back. Starting next week as our Slitty Sluggers comes back to Rincon Valley Park. Um, for all the details on these, I'm going to assume everybody has seen the new activity guide that came out a few weeks ago. And, and man, our enrollments and registrations were a huge hit and things are filling up quickly, which is a great sign that the public really wants our programs back. Um, so we're excited to be sharing these. So for the details on these programs, I'll let you look at the activity guide and all the details, but I wanted to share uh, what we're bringing back and what we're doing. Brand new for youth sports is we've decided to contract with National Academy of uh, Athletics. Uh, they do a lot of programs with neighboring communities in Petaluma and Windsor, and we thought it was a great way to offer more programs um, since we don't have the staff or the time um, or the equipment to do all these different programs. Um, so we're going to give it a try this spring. So as you can see here, we have 49 contracted camps and leagues we're going to be offering this spring and summer and see how it goes. And a whole variety of new things that we've never offered before is pickleball for the youth, the cheer and dance, uh, volleyball and soccer, or typical multi-sports camps, just to do a little bit of everything. Um, and flag football is a new one. So uh, excited to see how that goes uh, this spring. And then of course, we brought back our sports parties in the hub, uh, dodgeball, basketball and soccer, the hub room at the Sealing Community Center, which we call our sports room. Um, and those are popular. Greg got to do his first party this past weekend <laughs> and, and a dodgeball party. Um, so uh, that's what's coming back for youth sports. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, we also offer our adult softball league. And I wanted to share up there that this program has been a, around since at least 1968. That's as far back as we can find it. It's probably one of the oldest programs that we do uh, in the recreation division that has been around the longest. Uh, and it's incredibly popular. We did bring it back last summer and fall for 2021. We had 155 teams representing 2,300 players, uh, which was about 80% capacity, uh, which was pretty good for bringing that back during COVID. We're hoping for full capacity this summer in 2022. Registrations for teams will uh, start in April uh, for that program. It takes place at um, you know, Northwest Fields, Howarth Park, Galvin, Franklin, uh, softball fields, and it's a very popular program. Next slide. So probably gonna spend a little bit of the most of our time on this field, uh, or on this field, <laughs> I feel like I'm out on the fields, uh, on this slide. And this is something that is behind the scenes is per doing all the sports field league permits. Um, I shared with you the sports field rental guide, uh, and I hope you got a chance to look at that. One of that was, the reason is just, a, it's a very labor intensive uh, program that we do reserving and renting all of our sports fields to all the variety of clubs that use them. And uh, I think it's not understood. I mean, it's a two month process to get all their applications to try to assign them the fields that they want. Nobody ever leaves completely happy. Uh, rarely do we make everybody happy because they don't get enough fields. They want more fields. They all want the same fields. Um, because there's certain fields they don't feel safe at. There's certain fields that aren't in good condition or in worse condition than the others. Um, so it's a, it's a whole process working with all of our soccer clubs, little league clubs, um, and the adult clubs that also rent the fields from us. But 2021, I should say, was a huge success for renting our fields, actually a bigger success than in, in the past. I think during COVID, it was one of the few things people could do uh, was get outside and recreate in our fields and they were ready to do that. So when we went above and beyond and trying to find more additional spaces to offer, we kept our fields open longer. Um, and, and by doing that, we served more people um, in 2021, more clubs and leagues, kids and adults, uh, and increased our revenue, made almost $92,000 in just sports field rentals. Uh, which was pretty big for us. Um, but again, that was the one thing that we were expanding during COVID was our sports field rentals where everything else was closing down. We were opening more up and trying to make more available. Um, and then on that note, then we put the challenges of doing the field permits. Um, and I think you heard a few of the speakers tonight. They knew we were speaking, uh, Tim and I, and so wanted to join um, and have their comments. And, and so you've heard these, these same things probably, but for all the, the youth that we're representing and all the adults that are out there playing sports, uh, the demand exceeds what we have available. And not only what we have available, there are some places that people just won't play um, because again, feeling of the safety or the fields are in such bad condition, uh, they're not usable or safe to play on. So it's a constant battle when we do these sports field permits uh, of not having to turn people away, not giving them the field space they need for the number of kids they're serving. Um, and and it's, it's one of our challenges. Uh, the drought is also gonna be our challenge. Uh, fields are already, they already, clubs feel like the fields are already not safe, that they're hard, there's lumps, there's bumps, there's holes, and with the drought, and if we're not able to water um, and do the maintenance that are needed on them to roll them and aerate them, which we're hearing right now is part of the concern. Uh, softer season does begin March 14th, and right now the fields have not been aerated or rolled because of the concern with putting any water on them, and they're very dry and hard right now. So safety is a concern of some of our teams. So there was a letter from Adolfo that, and I think um, John mentioned that, that we can't bring teams to our city anymore that won't play on our fields. That's the reputation we're getting, and I think that's something the city needs to consider. It's not a good reputation. Um, we're also one of the few cities that does not have any all weather seal, all weather fields with lights to accommodate the year round play. I think that's been the biggest change in the last 20 years is soccer and baseball aren't seasonal sports anymore, they're year round. Um, and with that, that means we don't have any fields they can play on when they're wet and it's rainy and winter season. Uh, we have nothing when it's not daylight savings and it's dark at five o'clock, there's nowhere for the kids to go practice after five o'clock because our fields don't have lights. Uh, we're all, a lot of our neighboring cities have all done that. And Runner Park has four or five fields, Petaluma has six to 10 fields. And so our clubs are 
are driving to city facility, other city facilities in our neighboring communities to play. Um, John also mentioned our fields are overused and under maintained because it's year round play now there. We really only close them down for the three months in the winter. Um, so they are getting utilized nonstop seven days a week for games and practices with probably too many kids even practicing. They'll put three or four teams on one field for a practice uh, just because it's the only space available. We haven't put a lot of money into our sports facilities in 20 years. Um, you know, we're just doing the minimum to maintain them, but no, no big investment in them. Um, our fee structure for charging the clubs and leagues also should be evaluated at some point. It's a challenge. Again, the structure for charging per player fee was set up when sports were a seasonal uh, activity. It's no longer seasonal. They're playing year round and yet uh, we're still charging the per player fee. Um, which is again a great asset for those. It's a it, for the youth clubs. It's a great uh, benefit for them, um, but it needs to be analyzed and looked at. Other cities are starting to do it differently, and so we need to to rethink how we're doing that since uh, we're uh, we're permitting them dif differently now. And the other thing that's not on this list is lights that just came up recently. Is a lot of our light systems again the handful of uh, fields that we have lights on, which are our softball fields and our base, the one baseball field at Doyle. Um, those lighting, those lighted facilities are very outdated. The lights themselves, we have many lights out and to, we don't have the maintenance to get up and repair them. We don't, they don't have the time. Um, parts are falling. We don't, they're still on an old automated system. Someone needs to be there with the timer or, you know, the key and press the button. Um, besides Doyle, Doyle is one of the only uh, automated systems that's been set up so we can program those ahead of time for people that have rented that. So, um, you know, the light, um, the lights themselves need to be looked at and um, evaluated and, and upgraded at some point. So next slide. So wanting to end on a good note, uh, we do have some exciting things coming up. We have Pico's Professional Baseball has put in a proposal to offer some professional baseball at Doyle Park this summer. Uh, it would be eight weeks, uh, two nights a week, uh, and an incredible opportunity for the sports community to be able to go out and see some great games. Um, there are baseball groups that rent Doyle have all shifted their schedules to make sure we could accommodate this again, because it's a great opportunity for their clubs and kids and families to come out and watch some good baseball. Where we're at right now is the proposal is still going through the, the process of getting approvals. There are some requests from PICOS that we would have to accommodate. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've made the facility available. We're hoping to be able to offer it, but there's still some hoops to jump through to make that happen by June. And we're hoping we can do that. And then you heard from Casey tonight from Fast Strike, uh, Fastball Strike uh, Baseball. He offers a great program in town and wants to work with us on bringing Doyle Park uh, back to uh, its heyday of being a great facility. The same thing with Picos. They said they would also assist with doing some improvements uh, to the field um, so that, again, we can offer some, some exciting baseball on one of our best fields that we have that just has not been maintained. So some exciting things coming that we could possibly um, be seeing in the future. And... I think that's it. So with that, are there any questions about the youth and adult sports or permitting fields? Can we go back to uh, having our board members up on screen? Thank you. Any questions, comments from uh, any board members? I, I have a couple questions. Amy, thank you. And I really appreciate the um, frankness of your presentation. I was making notes that you essentially answered when you said that rate comparisons will be looked at. Um, will you be pursuing that in 2022? Will you be coming back with information to us? Uh, I assume the fee structure is going to be potentially adjusted, fees never go down, they just go up. Um, we'll be seeing you again. Yes, I think in 2022, that would be one of our goals is to do some fee comparison, see what other cities are doing it and how they're charging. Um, you know, again, part of the problem with doing field permits is they're, 
the, to maintain those permits takes more time than just doing the permit themselves because people call and cancel a day or time. They add a day or time. Oh, now they need more space, you know. Um, so it's it's not just like we create the permit and they're good for six months. It's a constantly changing. And I think there needs to be some adjustment made to that um, on how in the fees um, on setting that up. So it's not taking so much staff time because we just don't have all the staff to uh, maintain these like we're having to do right now. Terry, did you have a comment or question? Um, actually, my question was about the timing of the um, look at the fees. So Carol's covered that. Thank you. Any other board members? Amy, can you tell me, uh, so Doyle Park is the only lighted baseball field. Which parks have the uh, lighted uh, soccer fields or other fields? We don't have any lit soccer fields. Um, we have some uh, softball fields that are, have lights, which are Northwest softball fields that have three fields there, Franklin softball field, Galvin softball field, and Howarth Park softball field. So those are five softball fields that do have lights. We use those for adult softball program, but we are now renting those softball fields to the little league teams for practices under the lights right now. We also last winter in making space available, used some of the outfields of those softball fields to let the soccer groups have some practices. We were taking whatever space we could get, whatever time we could get, um, you know, and, and trying to set some parameters and rules around it so they didn't damage the baseball or softball fields, but giving them a place to play under the lights. Yeah, I played softball at Northwest, and I will admit there were some holes in the outfield that are a little scary. Um, and I did uh, get injured, but not not the city's fault. I was sliding into home plate, so that was my bad. Um, yeah, they do need some love, that's for sure. Um, thank you. I think that was my only question. Any last questions or comments from the board? Great, well, we'll see you again oh, later this year. I think oh, go does ahead. Guido has his hand up. Yeah, oh, just, I'm sorry about that, Guido. Go yeah. ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, I just had two comments. Number one, uh, the city has gotten a lot of money from PG&E because of the fire and so forth. Why can't uh, a little bit of that money be diverted to uh, help light some parks, number one. And number two, do we ever use any of the, any of the high school facilities for, uh, for uh, games and so forth, like soccer and baseball? So that's, I mean, that's been part of the, the evolution of how things have changed. The soccer uh, or the high schools have now, their sports are year round and all on their football, all weather lighted fields and they're very unavailable to all these clubs uh, that need them. And when they do need them, um, in fact, Adolfo, who was, is with Athletico, has some uh, very competitive teams that he has. And it's like five or 600 bucks for them to rent it for a few games to bring these competitive teams to Santa Rosa to play his teams if they want to have a home game. So the high schools are charging a, a lot and they're very unavailable because they have their own high school teams on them almost seven days a week now too between track and soccer and you know all their football and their programs that are on their facilities. And during the pandemic, the high school fields were not available at all. I'll just chime in regarding your pg e funds question, uh, board member Boccalioni. Uh, the council last night did um, uh, assign all of the funds from pg e last night. So those are no longer available for uh, these particular uses, but um, we are always looking for opportunities for grants opportunities. Um, we have the grant with the Ag and Open Space that we'll be looking at to bring uh, new artificial uh, turf fields to a place to uh, a place to play, and we're hoping to get some lighted fields in there. So we're we're working on it, and we're always looking for opportunities to find funds to double our money, so to speak. So. Um, if you hear of anything, we're always all ears as well. But we are keeping a, um, a close eye on it. We are working with our state and federal legislators to let them know this is an important um, topic for Santa Rosa. And so we're keeping an eye on it and we'll keep this board posted. Good. And then Chair Pitts, I didn't know if you wanted to, um, outside of our um, group, if you want to check in with the, um, the public for questions. Yes. Do we have any, I'm sorry about that. Do, do we have any public comments on this agenda item? 
We have no hands up at this time. All right. Thank you, Shelly. I'll learn how to do that correctly eventually. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone, for your comments and questions. And thank you, Amy. Thank you. Bye-bye. And uh, to uh, Mr. Desmond, who also appeared. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Take care. Thanks. Uh, okay, we are going to be moving on to item 7.2. That is the sports field maintenance update. Tim, are you still with us? Tim, the floor is yours. I am not hearing Tim. I can see Tim is still with us. Tim, I don't think you have a microphone that's working. Anything there? There we go. There you go. All right, got you. Please proceed. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, good evening, Chairman Pitts and other board members. I'm Tim Finnegan. I'm a Parks Crew Supervisor for the City of Santa Rosa. Um, I work alongside Elio Toronto um, as, um, as a supervisor. So both of us together oversee the, uh, um, the park system along with its employees. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a little um, outline of um, the sports fields. Um, and when I talk about sports fields, I'm talking about soccer fields, uh, ball fields, all sports fields in general um, with that, within the city of Santa Rosa that we maintain. I, this is just to give you an idea of the locations um, of these fields and the, the number of fields that we're overseeing. So, um, you know, uh, if you look at the bottom there, the totals, you know, we have three baseball fields. Um, 11 classified as baseball or softball fields, excuse me, uh, 19 soccer fields um, that are, are, are officially soccer fields. And then if you want to look at the, the courts, tennis and um, pickleball, that could be up probably in, in, to uh, interpretation because a lot of our, some of our courts, our, um, our tennis courts are used for pickleball. So um, they can probably go either way on some of those. But Again, this is just kind of give an idea of, of the, the field numbers that our staff is, is working on and um, um, where they're at uh, throughout the city. Next slide, please. So um, when we're, again, when we're talking about sports um, turf uh, maintenance, we're talking about all turf, regardless of, of whether they're soccer fields or softball, baseball fields. Um, and when we're talking about, again, fields and um, turf, we're talking about a plant. Um, and a plant, like any other plant, you know, has the life cycle. Um, and when we were, as a maintenance crew, um, that is, that what, that's what drives our, our maintenance, is where they're at in their life cycle um, and where we can get uh, the most benefit uh, from these activities. Um, and to provide, you know, a, a healthy turf that, or a healthy plant that can provide um, the, the elements for a good playing field. So, um, you know, a few things, you know, when you're dealing with plants, of course, you know, when we're looking at um, the winter time, a plant is going to be slow in grow growth. It's not going to be taking up a lot of nutrients. Um, generally, it's a lot colder um, and, you know, there's not as much maintenance needed. It's not growing. The mowing is not needed as much. Um, the plant is pretty much dormant. Um, and, you know, and it, it's just weathering the, the storms, weathering the water. Um, so again, it's a plant that has a life cycle. And as that moves into spring, um, you know, it starts to grow. Um, it's going to start taking up nutrients into the grass um, blades. Um, mowing is going to be increased. Uh, because of the growth. Um, that is the time that we want to be out in the fields uh, doing the maintenance that's, that's required. 
Um, and then again, as plants grow in, go into fall, they start slowing down, nutrients empty, start slowing down and so forth. So it's, again, it's, it's a, a whole, it's a plant. So um, like every other, like any plant, you know, it needs breaks, it needs water, it needs the sun, it needs all those elements to, to be successful. Um, and as a maintenance crew, that's what, that's our main goal is to promote that. Along with that, you know, the, the goal is always for us as a department to have safety, uh, safety to the end users and, uh, and a healthy turf. Um, you know, uh, usually it follows coincide with each other. So healthy turf equals a safer field. Um, that's, that, that is how it uh, correlates to each other. Um, so our normal, our operation normally um, starting in winter, when we talk about our maintenance and what we try to do as a maintenance crew, um, given the time, given the elements that we're dealing with, um, starting in winter, um, we usually, you know, turn off the irrigation. Um, that's the time that hopefully, we, you know, we get normal rainfall. Um, we turn off the irrigation. Um, we do a, a cycling of the valves to help um, exercise the valves. So um, the seats of the valves do not get stuck. It's just, it's a, it's a general checking of the system, operation of the system, making sure that, you know, there's no, um, no breaks that happen. Um, because even though we're not using the field, uh, things happen out in our parks that we don't necessarily have control over. So we're always kind of doing those checks of irrigation systems. Um, it's not as extensive as the other times, but it's still something we visit. Uh, another thing that we deal with is um, gopher control. Um, we do have a, uh, a contract with a um, outside party to um, check our field for, for gophers. Um, this is, actually is a year round event um, that we have scheduled for all of our, our sports turf fields um, for safety reasons. Um, so that, that goes on year round, but it's something that we always have to stay up on. Um, winter time, um, we also do some aeration if the weather and conditions are conducive to that. Um, generally that can happen. We would like to have that all kind of completed by the winter time, but it could carry over into the first part of winter, uh, depending on um, field use uh, availability um, that we can get in there and do the work and um, conditions of the field. Um, this is also a time that we would want to do some overseeding. Um, and what that means is basically um, uh, we, we developed a mix um, through, the, through experience over time, um, 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 throwing down extra seed to help uh, strengthen those uh, weak areas in our turf. Um, it just gives a little bit uh, stronger growth. All those wear areas, our hope is that we can get some seed down uh, prior to uh, temperature drops in the soil so we can get some good germination and um, hopefully with less play during the winter time that that, that new seedling uh, can get started and get established uh, with the rainfall naturally. And then come springtime, you know, we got a stronger stand. But that is the hope along with that would be a top dressing um, that would be put over the top of the, the turf to help um, uh, protect the seed, uh, provide a little cover for moisture covering the seed so that seed doesn't dry out before it can put down a root. Um, so that, that's very helpful if we can do that at the same time. Um, other times in an ideal situation would be doing some soil testing or fertilization. Um, this is more of just a maintenance period. And given the, given the weather, this may or may not happen. Um, and like, for example, this past year, uh, you would not be able to do any of this because we had such heavy rain there in October that um, all of that stuff would have been washed away and we definitely don't want to have leaching across the field. We want the plants to take it up. So unfortunately this, this time, uh, this year that did happen. Um, as we move out of, out of springtime, um, um, excuse me, moving into springtime, that's when we start really starting up our irrigation, checking things out in the normal season, um, making sure our irrigation heads are working properly, um, uh, doing more uh, checking of, uh, coverage and um, just spending a lot more time looking at our irrigation systems and our controllers. Um, a 
again, uh, gopher control is a year round thing. Uh, generally, this time, this time of year that you get more activity with gophers because again, they're an animal that's um, sensitive to heat and when it warms up, they get a lot more active. Um, so it becomes a lot more, uh, a lot bigger importance that we, we keep, a, keep up on those. Again, some aeration could happen during this time, given the weather conditions. Um, and then overseeding, top dressing, the same thing, and fertilization as well. As we go into summer, um, you know, the summer heat put the, put, a, put the big strain on our turf, the heat. Um, the amount of daylight that we have, of course, is a lot greater. Our watering windows a lot shorter. So um, all the, the work that, that leads up to summer is basically, at this point, is, is trying to hold that as much as possible. Um, because this is this is the time that turf takes a, takes a beating. Um, it's gone through spring, um, maybe some wet conditions of play in our field uh, by teams, uh, by clubs, and so at this point, you definitely want to um, try to keep it maintained as much as possible, keep water on it as much as possible when we're allowed to do it. Um, and so it, it takes quite a little bit of time. This is when we we notice probably a few more. Um, irrigation problems um, just because um, of the, the use of our irrigation along with um, which was interesting that a lot of our fields are adobe clay. Um, Galvin Park is a um, field two, the upper field at Galvin. Um, that's uh, been known to crack and um, this time of year that is one of the hardest places to keep those cracks from opening up and what's happening is, is that um, underneath the ground uh, in the subsoil, that soil is, is drying out and um, it's creating this, the soil to become tighter, it's contracting, and so it's pulling apart. And that all has to do with moisture. Um, if you add water to it, it starts to expand and those cracks disappear. So our main goal in that, in that case is to try to keep enough moisture and a, a strong root uh, with our turf to hold that, that ground together um, so those cracks don't open up and, and create a safety hazard. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, we're, we're not able to keep enough water and so we, we supplement a little bit of, of uh, soil um, into those cracks to help try to, to bridge them, to hold them and to, to you know, prevent injury. Um, so again, that's a, it's a challenging time of year, especially with our adobe soils in this area. As we get into fall, um, you know, we start turning down our irrigation. Uh, this is a very, very um, tricky time for our maintenance crew. Um, the biggest reason is because you, you have cooler nights, your, your daylight is shorter, your nights are longer, um, and um, you, you start seeing a lot of wet spots because we're not getting the evaporation as in a normal, normal day or normal wet summertime. And so uh, the fields become a lot wetter. We have to do a lot more adjustments um, and uh, you get a lot more dew over time because again, the, just the moisture level is rising. So there's quite a little bit of um, uh, adjustments during that time. Um, again, gopher control happens um, throughout the year. Aeration can start again at this time. Um, we definitely don't want to aerate during the summer time because um, the idea is to hold the moisture when you aerate, um, you promote um, 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 air into the soil. You, um, you, you allow air to get into the soil, which then dries out the soil. Um, so during fall, when we know we have the right conditions, things are cooling down, this is the time that we can, um, we can aerate, help with the upcoming uh, winter rains well, for water infiltration and um, uh, erosion um, and other factors. So this is a great time to start doing. And if we have time, again, later in the fall period, we would, you know, we would try to do some some overseeding with our grass mixes. Um, next slide, please. So um, the next one, you know, um, our next big focus when our maintenance is is the the ball fields and the infield uh, maintenance. Now this is just strictly when we're talking about we're talking about dirt. Um, this is the infields and the softballs, and of course the 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 dirt of the the baseball fields. 
Um, and again, our main goal is is safety, uh, safety for the players. Um, and and why we don't necessarily always able to meet those goals, um, that that's that's our job is to provide the safe plane for everybody. Um, we've had a lot of um, why we do try to check on them um, on a daily basis. Um, it's definitely hard to get around physically and look at every single spot. And I greatly appreciate the, the clubs that um, that use our fields. We have great communication with them. Um, so when they see issues as far as safety, um, they're welcome to call us. They call um, Amy um, there at the in recreation and we, we address those as soon as possible. Um, but when we're looking at our infields, we're basically looking um, at three times of the year um, that you know our focus is on, and that's preseason, uh, where we try to do some weekly drags. We're 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 trying to get the field into shape. You know, after rain events, after um, um, long long wet spells, um, times that we can't necessarily be on the field because we've actually caused more of a mess. I mean, it's it's mud, um, and it cuts, and we don't want to <laughs> we don't want to make more of a mess. By, by trying to be on or trying to do something. Um, but once, you know, we know that the weather has turned in the, in the spring, we start our preseason, which includes uh, two dragging, some weed control, um, um, which includes some mechanical types, which is, a, you know, a regular drag or two drag. We also have been using, um, in some cases, some organic herbicide applications. Um, to do some the burning of the, the top portion of the, the, the weeds as a contact herbicide, um, all organic. Uh, we don't use any um, any synthetic type um, applications uh, in any of our, our chemical app, uh, applying applications. Um, and then we then you know check out equipment bases, base pegs, um, look at those highway high wear areas around bases, and then we try to start inspecting for holes. Um, we all for that. We know basically you're you know you walk in the field and uh, filling them up with some um, amended loam. We do when we do that, we try to throw down a little seed at the same time to help uh, you know promote a little bit of growth in that grass to get reestablished if if we possibly can. Um, during the ball season itself, um, that's when we go into to a weekly mode. Um, this is supporting the, the programming uh, for recreation and their, their softball and, and um, leagues. Um, and that uh, includes the daily prep, which again, kind of follows what we would do on a weekly basis, but tightening it up to a, a daily activity of checking the where places around home plate, first, second, third base, um, packing some new infield around those areas checking for uh, bases, making sure they're, they're, they're tight, they're snug um, to a point as far as safety wise. And, and, and again, just kind of keeping, doing the maintenance period. Um, and once, once clubs get on these fields, it, it definitely helps out on the weeds. Um, ball season, we usually don't have a problem with the weeds because there's enough play on it. There's enough people, kids sliding um, um, activity that we do not have to um, work as hard in the in the weed control. Um, and then at, at the very end, at the you know the postseason, um, again, our goal is to try to have year-round um, um, activity of weed control in these fields, so they don't become overly grown. Um, doing some tooth uh, tooth dragging, if weather is conducive, um, repairing some transition areas, um, and that's the area between the dirt and the, the sod, um, trying to get that cleaned up a little bit. If um, over time as clubs and as we do the, 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 the maintenance, dirt gets pushed out and there becomes a hump um, in that transition area. So our goal is to try to keep that uh, pushed back, cleaned up. Um, sometimes you end up having to, to dig them out and reestablish turf in those areas. But the best practice is to try to keep um, keep them clean um, going into it so it doesn't become a, a bigger mess um, later on. Um, and again, just kind of general equipment repair, visual repair um, on these things. And again, just trying to stay up on these items so they do not get too overwhelming or uh, you know, 
when someone's out, you know, playing a game with their 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 kids or something that um, that no one gets hurt on the equipment that's that's out there. Um, all our fields are open. All turf is open um, year round, with the exception of the, the, some of the ball fields that we do try to lock up just to keep the area maintained and keep it safe and from vandals. And um, so, but all of our fields are open for the public at year round uh, soccer fields. So it's not uncommon that you would see on a weekend someone playing soccer. And again, that's that's our goal is to provide a safe uh, playing area for all of all of the residents of Santa Rosa. Next slide, please. So um, some of the challenges that that we face, um, you know, weather is, is a big one. Um, of course, everything is dependent. You're talking about a plant and us being on on dirt sod during wet or dry periods. Uh, that can can cause us problems. Um, if the field is wet, if it's soggy from a long spell of rain, uh, we can't be out on the fields doing the aeration. We can't be doing the things that would promote um, a healthier turf. The best thing is actually is to stay off the field and, and let nature takes it takes its course. Um, it's really sort of deceiving though in this area and what we found out, you know, especially this past year, or um, is that after big rain events, you know, the fields are saturated, you walk out there, you're walking, it feels like you're walking on a big sponge. Um, and there's absolutely nothing um, in our maintenance department that we can do to, um, to prevent that. Um, the, the best thing is for naturally the fields to dry out um, and it can dry out because of, you know, the air temperature, wind, sun, or just percolating through the soil. Um, when we're on when, when we're on clay soils, it just takes longer. Uh, water doesn't percolate through clay very quickly um, because of the pores. Um, the pores of sand are a lot bigger, so water can travel through that. Clay, they're a lot smaller, they're tighter. It holds on to the moisture a lot longer. So unfortunately, um, you know, you know, when we have um, a big rainy event, and then the next weekend we have you know 70 degree weather. Everybody wants to be out in the field because it's beautiful weather. Um, natural, you know, turf and dirt, um, it, it doesn't dry out. So you just have to wait. Um, you cannot get on there and start playing on it. You will start tearing it up. So it's, it's a really challenge for us as a maintenance team dealing with the weather, especially wet, cold weather and, and doing anything um, with fields and then being able to predict what the weather is going to do. Um, you know, we, we plan as, as best we can, but, in the, you know, we don't have control over the, the rain and when it happens, how much it happens. So we're pretty much at its mercy. Um, and the next thing, you know, along with the weather is the drought. Um, uh, Amy touched on it a little bit. And this is, you know, something that's, um, you know, it's not, it's, well, looking out the day, how sunny it is. It, it's something that's that's going to be a really challenge for us uh, this coming year. Um, currently, um, we are following uh, the guidelines set by um, the state and our water department on on water use. Um, and currently, they're they're requiring a 20% reduction um, from um, from this time. Um, and how they're doing that is they're looking at two years ago when we weren't in a drought. And they expect that we follow the same same um, rule. So what that means, if if they say like they'll look at the records for us at this time last two years ago, and they'll want to see that it's 20% reducted at this point. Well, if two years ago we were wet and we weren't doing any watering at this time, so we're basically at zero to you know today because we didn't use any water two years ago. So. It's been a really challenge, and I think it will be a really challenge going forward as we look at where the levels of the the, the reservoir, the lake is, um, what we have available for water, that these restrictions will only get tougher for us um, moving forward. So um, we are working with uh, water use efficiency, um, talking with them, showing them our field, 
uh, working with them and showing our, 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 our maintenance problems related to the drought. But this is a lot bigger problem than just the city of Santa Rosa. I mean, this is a state problem. Um, and, you know, it, I don't know what the summer is going to look like, but if we don't get any, you know, rain, serious rain, it could really put our field and our, our turf in, um, in a real bad shape. Um, so um, I just want to, to, to let everyone know we're doing the best we can, but we are like every other um, um, individual in the city that we're expected to follow the rules um, as as it presented to us. Um, and so um, it is a challenge for us. Um, another challenge that we're facing is uh, resources. Um, the labor and the funds, um, all of our, our labor um, is shared throughout the city with every other task that we're assigned to do. Um, if we have a, a tree emergency, we have parks crew doing tree work, um, taking care of those. Um, if we have, um, if we have uh, playgrounds that need inspection, need repairs, it's the same crew that that does sports fields that do the repairs on our playgrounds. It's the same crew that does the restroom cleaning. So there's a just a there's a lot that we're spread out on. Um, we try to focus on the seasonal stuff and try to we try to make that a priority. But um, again, you know we're spread out um, across the board. We have you know 67. 70 parks um, across the city that our staff maintains, along with uh, landscape areas, um, um, trying to keep vision triangles and medians clean for safe passage. So it's, there's just a lot going on that our crew has to do. And ball field turf maintenance is, is one of many. Um, another challenge is the animal damage, um, gophers and weeds. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned about our, our contractor. Um, unfortunately, we don't have control over gophers, um, where they run, where they start their 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 home, and so um, it has to be a year-round process for us. Um, we've had spells where gophers has been more of a problem and less of a problem, um, and when we know that we have more of a problem, we make sure that we communicate with our our contractor to make sure that those areas are hit. Um, and, and monitored and um, the, the gophers are treated. Um, along with that, you know, the weed controls. Um, um, like I mentioned, we, we, we use mechanical means, whether that's mowing the weeds down, using um, some tillage type equipment mechanically to take care of the weeds in the infield, um, and use of, of organic um, uh, pesticide uh, to try to burn some of those down, weeds down. Um, so it's a combination that we try to use an IPM approach that one thing is not going to fix everything. Um, but we want to make sure that we do it responsibly and um, look at the look at what the best option is given the time that we're, we're trying to do that work. Um, another challenge is this human damage vandalism graffiti. Um, you know, um, there's there's just maintenance needs that we don't plan on and um, and, and the picture there on the bottom there um, shows, you know, someone decided to take a joyride on one of our soccer fields. And so again, that takes extra work on us to, to try to re repair that uh, and get that back in playable condition. Um, and again, you're talking about a, a living, a grass, a plant. And unfortunately, you know, you can't fix something like that overnight. It, it takes time, it takes seed, it takes water. And, um, um, and you know, unfortunately, some people feel like, you know, that's something they they need to do, but it definitely doesn't make our job any easier when we have to deal with that. Um, and then one of the other things is, you know, just time. Um, grass needs time to rest. And, um, you know, it, it, the ideal situation that you would let it grow, you let it get stronger, um, and then it can withstand a lot of play. But you know, three months out of the year in a time that the grass in any plant is not growing because it's not the season for it to grow. It's really hard to establish and get a good grass growing in a three month period when the plant has shut down and basically it's dormant 
until the springtime. So, um, so that is, um, that's a big challenge for us. I mean, we, we work around what, it, what we can as far as uh, supporting recreation. We, we've done some field closures um, to kind of give a little bit more time for that, the grass to grow. But when we do that, we take fields out of, out of playability and then it puts more stress on some of our other fields. So there, there's definitely things that we're doing to try to, try to help out in, in all these cases, but um, it's definitely, you know, every year is different. Um, every year is, is a challenge. And while we have a lot of goals and we try to perform on all those goals, unfortunately, it doesn't always um, pan out the way we, we plan. Um, it's just factors that we, we can't control of. Um, next slide. So I, I'd like to finish by just thanking, thanking all of, of the board um, for your support. Um, I definitely want to uh, thank um, the, the, the support of getting us um, some groundskeepers um, and that we were been able to add on to our staff to help out with some of these, these uh, ball field maintenance needs. Um, our plan is to use those, those, main, those temporary groundskeepers as, um, as maintenance in our ball fields. So I, I greatly appreciate um, your support and your uh, communication with the, the city council and the members on, on getting us the support and uh, being a voice for us because um, without your support and your help, um, um, we would definitely, um, it would be a lot harder to do our job. So I just wanted to say thank you. And with that, if you have any questions or comments, I'd be, I would try to, try to answer them for you. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I'll do this right this time. We're going to always try to go to public comment right after a presentation. But before that, if anyone has any clarifying questions, so no comments or deep inquiries, just kind of a clarifying question on that presentation from any board members. Steve, was that a hand raised or a light adjustment? I'm going to go with light adjustment. Um, Okay, let's uh, move on to public comment. Do we have any public comments on agenda item 7.2? We do, we have one hand. John, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute. Hello again, um, I just wanted to thank the park maintenance staff for their diligent work trying to keep these fields uh, in these parks in as good a shape as they can with the limited resources they have. Uh, I wanted to comment that on your list of challenges, one that you failed to uh, put in there is the overuse of fields. And, you know, this, these grass fields, they're, they're underlain by living organisms that have a, an ability to repair themselves and they have an ability to um, withstand a certain amount of use. What we find is oftentimes we are scheduling, we, the city of Santa Rosa is scheduling uh, so much use on these fields that it exceeds the capacity of the turf to heal itself. And so over an extended period of time, the turf breaks down. As was suggested earlier uh, by the city staff, you know, one of the solutions we have is to build more fields so any individual field would get less use. Um, and in the light of the drought, uh, we would be inclined to support uh, building more artificial turf fields with bikes. The artificial turf fields generally don't require water. Um, you have lights, you can turn on them in the evening. Again, your artificial field can bear more of the load from the community. Um, and, and relieve some of the overuse of the natural grass fields. So, you know, it's a big integrated problem where you have to look at your field maintenance practices along with your new fields, at, uh, um, trying to get uh, a mix of fields that will allow you to um, get more use of your fields and the 
natural grass fields to some extent. Um, we are all cognizant that we're in a drought environment here. By putting in, I think there have been two 25-year contracts in recent years. And uh, I'm sorry, John, just, you keep cutting out. Oh, I do. Um, let's see. Uh, wrong one. There uh -huh. we go. I'm going to change the job right here. Better? Is that yeah, better? I think so. Yeah, go ahead. I was just saying that the city of Las Vegas put in to the greater Las Vegas area. I think some of them were in Henderson and one were in somewhere in Las Vegas. They put in two very large artificial turf complexes in part to relieve their water demands. Um, and that's something that in the long run we may have to do. And, and the long run may be shorter than we think if this drought gets uh, worse or continues for a long time. And uh, again, thank you, Tim. Um, I would just ask Tim, if you could comment on how many times in say the last three years, you've done these three seasons of aeration and overseeding on the 19 soccer fields because my general understanding and observation is that stuff hasn't been done regularly in recent years. Thank you, John, for that comment. Um, all right, we are gonna move on to any board member comments or questions for Tim. Terry, you're up. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the presentation, Tim. So um, Mr. Quinn, our public speaker actually brought up my big question, which is the pros and cons from a maintenance standpoint of artificial turf or all weather turf versus natural turf and setting the cost aside, because I know an installation of those fields is or conversion of those fields is really prohibitively expensive. But just from a maintenance standpoint, can you help me understand um, the benefits or even the, the, the cons of an artificial turf field? So as far as the maintenance of an artificial turf, there is still maintenance required for artificial turf. Um, some of those um, are um, what they call like combing, um, where you, you have to basically it's you know dragging a machine kind of combing the 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 field um to, to keep the material in its the right place um, because it can also move around underneath the, the top layer um, of the surface um, other things that happen as well as um, is going through and actually uh with the magnet and and picking up any metal objects whatsoever uh, again that anything metal can that gets into that could cause damage to it. Um, so you want to uh, continuing to uh, like, they have them set up as just basically big magnets that you have to drive over them uh, to, to pick up any metal pieces. Um, and so like, and I mentioned the combing and then the grooming, again, a lot of it's just, it's not probably as extensive as, as you know, say a turf, uh, regular uh, natural turf, but there is still the maintenance requirement. And even the maintenance, even there's irrigation sometimes required of the artificial turf um, because it does get hot. Um, so there is possibly could be some irrigation required to, to water it down. Um, the big thing it does, as it mentioned, it does save on water usage. Um, but as far as the maintenance, there is still you know, a maintenance requirement uh, associated with it. And again, depending on the play of the field, you would have to do the, the combing or the grooming uh, more often or, le or less, depending on the play. Um, because again, when you invest that much money, you wanna make sure that it lasts the, the longest as possible. So uh, it probably would be more, it, it would be more a schedule, more of a priority to make sure all that happens because you don't wanna damage that turf, um, that, that, that artificial turf 
and shorten its lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would probably have to be put a priority, whereas the, 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 the natural turf would be, you know, it's more forgiving overall uh, because you can fix that. Um, it might take a little time on these spots, but you can fix those, those, those areas, those high wear areas. Um, but you don't have that option. If you, if you make a mistake or miss something, or if that artificial turf gets damaged, then, then it's a bigger, a lot bigger expense in the long run. And after a wet weather event, is the artificial turf field more playable sooner than a natural turf field? Oh yeah, definitely. It, it's set up for that. It, I mean, it's set up for to, to be playable on, on rain and, and wet conditions. Um, there's, there's drainage associated with it um, that takes the water away. Um, but yeah, it, it's all weather. So it doesn't matter if it's rainy, sunny, um, you can play on it any time. Okay, thank you. Carolina, go ahead. Uh, I want to thank you for the wonderful job that you're doing on all those fields. I'm always amazed how many there are. And whenever you go by them, and it's pretty easy to go by a park or any kind of a playing field in Santa Rosa, and they really look terrific. And I, I want to thank you. I know this just doesn't happen. I just want to thank you for for staying on top of it and giving us the wonderful opportunities for the kids and the families to play. So you and your your guys are great. It's, it's, a, it's our pleasure. Uh, everyone, our whole crew is very proud of the work they do. They take a lot of pride in the fields. Um, in you the can party. tell. So um, I, I will definitely pass that on to them and they'll, they'll greatly appreciate it. So thank you. Good. Any other board comments or questions? Carol, go ahead. Hi, Tim. Hello. Uh, several, several questions, go figure. Um, going back to the surf, sports turf maintenance, um, four seasons. From what I can tell, the fields, not necessarily the baseball fields, but the open fields, they're in use year round. Uh, they don't really have off seasons. I know that individual fields are sometimes put fallow and marked. Um, sometimes those signs are respected and observed. Sometimes they're not. Do you, regardless of the weather, regardless of the use, or is um, the third slide kind of more of an ideal than a practical reality? Uh, it's more ideal than reality. Um, we, we're definitely kind of at the mercy um, in, for the most part of our, our field usage. Um, you know, our, our goal is to have fields available for everybody, uh, regardless of the time of year. Um, and we can't necessarily police, you know, keeping people out of them. Um, and so we, we do the best we can. Um, you know, there's road groups that, that play in fields that, um, you know, have, that can tear them up in a weekend. And it, it is a challenge, you know, because they are open to everybody uh, for use. But yeah, it's more of ideal situation is the slide I'm showing. And, you know, that's our goal. That's what we strive to get. Thank you. My next question had to do with um, uh, perspective on how many hours a day. Again, this would be more soccer fields. How many groups can come through? How often the turnover is? And if... Um, any of the groups that use them ever do a bit of maintenance between events, um, be it um, replacing divots. Um, can, can we ask our users to help out uh, a, a challenging situation? So I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so uh, on the soccer side of things, um, we, have had not, we have not had a group or you know, volunteer um, well, actually, I take that back. Uh, once in a while, we get a group that, that would volunteer to do uh, you know, a divot replace, or uh, we provide um, um, soil um, for them that they can go out and do some replacement. Generally, it's the younger, um, younger clubs that are willing to do that um, aspect of it. Not so much maybe the older uh, uh, teams uh, are inclined to do that. 
but we've had members uh, step up and, and offer some help and, 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 and give us support in some ways. Um, we get that more support probably from the, the softball and baseball leagues. Um, they are very good um, because uh, about volunteering and helping us out maintain those fields. And so I guess I wanna make sure I thank them because we, we do get a lot from them. Um, they are, um, uh, they take a lot of pride in their fields. Um, and as baseball players and as younger, uh, younger age group, um, they definitely take, uh, get involved with that. So um, we do work with a lot of the groups, uh, more so on the, the, the baseball softball side than the soccer. Um, again, it, it kind of goes with, with the age um, and, uh, and what, what they're willing to do. But we don't necessarily require that as part of their agreement. Uh, a lot of times they just volunteer to do it, but there's no requirement for them. Thank you. And my last question was um, a soccer field. How many hours a day could a field be getting hammered uh, by well, you, with use? I, you know, on the weekend, I, I it probably all day from probably from eight o'clock or from sun up to sundown uh, that a soccer field can be used. Um, that's probably probably a better question probably for for Amy. Uh, because of the scheduling that she does um, but I can definitely we can definitely tell a weekend uh, separate from a weekday uh, on our field use because uh, come Monday Tuesday when we're out there you know um, seeing the, checking out the damages you can definitely see the wear over a weekend period of time um, generally like during the weekdays maybe in the evenings because that's when kids and stuff are are playing so you know maybe they can get a, a game in there in the evening, but on the weekend, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're probably sun up to sun down. Thank you. I'll, I'll add to that, Carol, that they are rented on the weekends, every field from 9 a.m. to about 6 p.m. on the weekends. And if there's sunlight hours and when they're done, if the game ends early, there are road groups standing on the side of the field ready to take the field as soon as a sanctioned team with a permit leaves, there's other teams and road groups showing up to take the field. So they are, as Tim said, used seven days a week from morning till night. Any other questions or comments from board members? All right, Tim, I had a few. Um, there's, we got a presentation a few months ago from a consulting firm that's doing a maintenance assessment. And I know that's not the right term, so Jen or, or Tim, whatever that, that uh, the study we're doing. Um, so tell me the right term and then what's your interaction with that? Um, so, I mean, you're correct in the, the term they're doing, they're assessing the park use. Um, so, but so yeah, and, and our communication with them, um, they, they pr uh, provided us kind of with um, a, a outline or a survey that we took around to all our fields in evaluating those items that we that we are involved with. A big one was irrigation, um, um, because we're in there, you know, hands-on uh, doing our irrigation repairs, knowing the age of the system, knowing the problems of the system. Um, we gave that input to them to put into their metrics um, and and seeing where everything sits at. Um, so and then. It, Along with that irrigation, you know, that kind of goes hand in hand with the turf. Um, usually if you see poor looking turf, it's generally associated with poor irrigation. So um, those go hand in hand, um, but we, we work, you know, hand in hand with them and, um, and determining uh, what, what was wrong with certain parts um, and, and what needs to be fixed and repaired and where are we having challenges at. Okay, that's great. I, I think that's a really important effort that the public will eventually be able to see those uh, scores and all the information and, and hold us accountable. Um, and you'll keep doing a great job. Uh, I had a question too on the drought issue. Um, how, how about how much, what percentage of the city's water use is our, uh, our acreage at parks? Do you know that um, off the top of your head? Like the average park size, is that what you're kind of? No, in the total out of 100%, what percentage is used on our parks? 
as far as our water usage? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, like a lot of our a lot of our parks, I mean, they they were designed with a lot of turf. It's not until here recently that you know they've kind of switched over and you know having smaller turf panels and so forth. So as as far as the the water that we use, um, it's it's probably probably you know 90 95 percent of the water that maintenance uses is okay. turf. I was going to say, I, I can chime in and just let you know, we don't usually track comparisons uh, by department. We certainly have um, a water <clears throat> a water budget for how much we use in, in parks, and we can get that information. We can get that information to you and as a comparison, but it's not something we necessarily look at from a um, you know, who's using water and facilities, if that's what you're asking, and who's using water. No, that's, no, sorry, <laughs> and maybe, Tim, that question wasn't for you. That was more... I, I know it's not a lot is what I'm getting at. I know it's like in the single digits of the city's total water use. And I think to members of the public, they might think it's a lot more. So I think it would be helpful to, to broadcast that more widely to folks that, you know, all these fields, everything. So for example, single family homes were like over 80% of the city's water use. So out of that 100%, 80 is people's houses. I'm just trying to figure out how we can communicate to the public because I hear that from folks is how much water are we using at the parks? And so I just want to be able to go back to them and say, well, actually only 7% of the city's water waters our parks um, or whatever it's doing, you know, flushing toilets or, or anything. Um, yeah, Carol, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, I have an anecdotal um, comment on that. At a recent park cleanup, someone came by and asked uh, staff why everything looks so green. They weren't allowed to water their lawns, but everything looks so green. And staff said, well, it's winter. We don't water except for the ballpark, which uh, the ball field, Jen, you can correct me or Tim, um, there was a safety issue where certain fields in use have to be watered as a safety accommodation, but the parks themselves are not watered. And I thought maybe some um, courtesy signs along those lines that said something like, note, um, water is not being used on, word it properly, um, it, people didn't like thinking that the parks were getting to do something that they weren't. And um, a little bit of information could potentially go a long way. Yeah, great point, Carol. And Tim, by the way, I was at that cleanup, I think Carol's talking about too, and so was Madonna at Franklin Park. So I wanted to say good job to your crew on that. It was fun to, to come out and do that. Anyways, if you wanna to respond to Carol, go ahead. All right, well, well thank you. Uh, Carol's, I mean, exactly right. I mean, we are not, I mean, we are not watering the parks and the time of the year, uh, things are green. This is still winter. And so, um, I mean, we are doing some watering now currently to, as far as safety wise and for seeing some of the areas that are getting dried out that we can put a little bit of water on. But for the most part, everything you, you see right now is all natural, um, you know, morning dew and so forth, the, the, the moisture is drawn up during the night. Um, so everything looks wet. And so it's a little deceiving right now. And again, I understand it here, you know, middle of February, we had, you know, close to 80 degree weather. And so it does feel like spring, but it is still winter and the plant is doing what it does during the winter time. It, it stays green because it, the conditions are, are perfect for it. Yep. Okay, thanks, Tim. Those were my questions. Uh, oh, Terry, go ahead. Just one quick follow-up question, actually, to your question, Logan. Are we using um, reclaimed water on any of our parks? Uh, yes, we are. Um, I can answer that. Uh, so the, the, the field that we're able to have reclaimed water actually is just the one is at a place to play. Um, that's, that's as far as the system has been designed to. To handle um, another, we have a few other little parks, and Finley Park has reclaimed water on it. But it's th that's as far as the system has been uh, brought to it. A lot of the water, of course, is going up to the um, to the, uh, the for, for the um, of the geysers. And so, as far as expanding the system, um, I think 
they've talked a little bit about that at the higher levels of how much water we're giving that to that operation that we couldn't possibly make available to some of our other operations. But currently the only, uh, say, ball soccer field or uh, sports field that we got reclaimed water actually happening is that a place to play. Okay. Yeah, I remember the days where we couldn't give it away and now it's quite the commodity. So <laughs> thank you. Carol. I, I, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong. Don't we also have well water used um, specifically out at um, Galvin? I don't know if there's any other that's on well. Um, so, it, well, the, at Galvin, the only probably well water that is for the golf course. The park itself is is domestic water um, that waters that field. Um, and we do have some other well, um, Jennings Park um, and um, Southwest Park have, have some wells that we're able to pull some from to water those fields. So there is some out there, but majority is, is domestic water. All right, if that Chair, is everyone. Chair Pitts, we, we have a follow-up question from John, if, you're, if you have time. Uh, yeah, we can entertain another okay. public comment, that's fine. All right, John, we'll give you one more minute. Great. I, I started that raising my hand on the artificial turf maintenance thing. I have been involved in artificial turf fields for, I don't know, 17 or 18 years now and have maintained artificial turf fields for 17 or 18 years. They require maintenance, same order of magnitude as a natural grass field if you want to maintain them at a high level. FIFA recommends that you groom a artificial turf field for every 40 hours of use by 22 players. So um, if you're a typical youth environment, you're gonna get between 40 and 80 hours of use per week on an artificial turf field. And you know, somebody was talking about usage. Um, one of the things I would say is on a natural grass field, um, the field will probably sustain about 20 hours of use a week. You get about 15 hours of use after school and you get about 16 hours of use on the weekends. And so you're breaking down the field over time. Thank you, John. Succinct and right on time. Um, Chair, Chair Pitts, you are muted. Oh, I am muted, thank you. Uh, thanks, John, for that comment. Just one other thing I'll add is I don't know why there's some people that really hate artificial turf and have um, some conspiracy theories about it. So you might get uh, that that sort of interaction, Tim, um, if we ever go down that road. But uh, thank you for that presentation. And, um, and thanks to Amy for helping out. All right, have a good evening, thank you. Thanks, you too. All right. Uh, Thank you everyone for the great questions and the discussion. Uh, next on the agenda is item eight, our committee reports. Um, item 8.1 is our mayor's lunch. Uh, I attended that and uh, as did Carol and I don't have any major updates. I think one that is not gonna surprise folks is the Board of Public Utilities is looking at more drought related uh, restrictions. Basically, if the city does not get a lot more rain, we're gonna be entering into what's known as stage five. And the, the, the highlight of stage five, there's a lot, but it would put a new building moratorium, new housing moratorium into effect. So this is an ordinance from the 1990s that, that's never really been updated. Uh, I think the council will definitely be updating that part of it and maybe others. But, um, you know, could be in for a long, long, hot summer. Um, the other update was from uh, the Charter Review Committee. The chair, Patty Cisco, shared some of our work. I'm, I'm also on that. And we're definitely looking at some interesting stuff. We've gotten through pay, uh, increasing council member pay. Um, that's going to go to the city council to possibly place on the ballot. Uh, we debated an at-large elected mayor. That was more mixed kind of a basic, almost a split vote. Um, so the council can take that up or not and ask the voters to approve that. Um, and these, these changes would go in the November 2022 ballot to change the charter. And then the other one was about ranked choice voting. So we have nine more topics the city council assigned us. So 
I'm sure I'll, I'll have more to update folks. And uh, that's some interesting stuff. If you want some some hardcore political science stuff, go watch those meetings. It's, it's uh, I love it. So, um, and item 8.2, any questions on that? Any comments? All right. Um, item 8.2, uh, Carol, do you have a report from the Waterways Committee? I do. Um, last month, we were presented with a, a proposal from the Hyatt down on the uh, Santa Rosa Creek, um, wanting to rather drastically update their fencing um, because of problems with the homeless issue. And the um, presentation, um, it wasn't as fleshed out as the board had wanted. So it's been revised and is coming back to the Waterways Committee tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, as a result of this 800 foot long fence on the Prince Memorial Greenway, I've had even more cause to go down. Um, I uh, visit it regularly on my bicycle, but I am pleased to report that currently the uh, the path is amazingly clean to the point where last Saturday's um, river cleanup, the river community cleans it up. I, I wanted to go, couldn't, uh, emailed a friend afterwards and said, sorry, too cold for me. And she reported back, that's okay. It was a huge turnout and very little to do. Now, I have never heard anything so wonderful as there was very little to do on the, uh, on the creek. So we'll see what happens um, tomorrow. We'll see what happens moving forward with this project. And many things are starting to pop uh, on the downtown section of the Santa Rosa Creek. More on that at a later date. Thanks, Carol. I rode my bike down there on Saturday and it was looking good. Um, Thanks for that report. Uh, okay, we are moving on. Any questions or comments from the board? No? Uh, Director Santos, we are moving on to agenda item nine. Do we have any written or electronic communications? So the, the board received two electronic communications, one from Adolfo Mendoza regarding uh, park and field maintenance uh, specifically uh, regarding soccer, and another one from Casey Ollenberger from uh, regarding Doyle baseball field. Thank you. All right, uh, we are on to uh, agenda item 10. Um, this is our future agenda items. Um, normally I would go at the end, but I wanna, um, I wanna kick this one off uh, with something that's important to me. Uh, I would like us to discuss in the future um, a plaque at Flat Rock Park. And for those that aren't familiar with this plaque, it's pretty old. It was put there in 1936. And uh, by today's standards, it's basically, it's, it's very offensive and uh, basically racist. Uh, it uses, it glorifies a myth about how Santa Rosa was named. Um, and just putting that aside, whether that happened or not, it uses the, the term Indian made to, de to describe the event. Um, anyways, I, what I've done is I've directed staff to look at how we can possibly remove this plaque. Um, it definitely does not fit our modern standards. It does not fit the city's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I think it should, it should be taken down. Um, what happens after that, I think, is is a broader discussion, and I, I want to get folks' thoughts on this when now or when we talk about it in the future. Um, but I also want to broaden this conversation to other park sites that that could use an addition or a subtraction to to recognize um, some of our marginalized communities. Um, for example, we have Comstock Mall downtown where there used to be a historic Chinatown and there's no recognition of that right now. So I want folks to use your imagination, use your heart and try to figure out how we can do better as a city. Um, so I've spoken uh, with uh, board member Cruz about this and with staff. So we'll be, 
talking about Flat Rock Park in the future, um, it's, it's near and dear to my heart. I grew up nearby playing there a lot. Um, and I'll just tell you, I've had city residents bring this up with me too. This isn't just my own issue. Um, they've, they're deeply offended by it. Um, and that's not how folks should, should feel when they visit our park. So we'll see that in the future. Um, and Madonna, uh, go yes. ahead. You have some thank, thank you. Yes, I, I want it torn down as soon as possible, but um, in a respectful and professional way. Um, the, the research and, um, you know, wants from the, from the native community um, is where I would want to go. Who would I give that um, information or suggestions to? Would that be to Jen or would that be to you, uh, Mr. Pitts? Jen, go ahead. I would say, please feel free to uh, send me any information you have, or if anybody else on the board has comments or questions, um, please feel free to send those to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and most, you know, and, and to me, it's uh, reaching out to the, um, the the natives that were here, you know, the, the Miwok. So, um, and, and I am not Miwok, but my, my relatives are. So um, I know who I need to talk with. Thank you. Thanks, Madonna. Carol, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if there are any protocols in place for um, this kind of thing. Um, we would be usually, in my long history, we would usually be at the end of this process reviewing it. Um, good, for, good on you for spearheading this, but I'm wondering if there are um, city um, protocols or um, steps in place um, that we should acknowledge. And, and the other thing um, unrelated is in looking at the um, presentation schedule that Shelley presented at the beginning of the year. Uh, today was scheduled for park planning 2022. I'm wondering if that has been moved to a different um, month and I would move that on my calendar if, if um, that's been decided. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, on the first point, that's a great question. Um, so Jen is, is looking into that and I'll let her speak to that and, and working with the city attorney's office on uh, how we would do that. Um, it's also sort of adjacent to our, our update to our naming policy on parks. Um, so those are good questions, Carol, and we need to probably make better procedures if we don't have them, um, but they are looking into that. And then also on the scheduling, I'll, I'll let Jen answer that one too on the uh, scheduled items. Go ahead, Jen. Sure, and you know one of the things we're looking at is there doesn't appear to be any particular policy relating to something like this. So uh, one of the reasons we'll be bringing this back at a future date is that it's it's more than a discussion for this board. It's a discussion for city and city council members and the city attorney's office. So it's it's going to be a much bigger um, endeavor, and so we want to make sure we're having that um, discussion with our uh, elected officials and our executive team at the city, and we'll be bringing back updates here to the board when we have them uh, for discussion at the board level. Um, and then, yes, we often do move things around on our schedule, depending on different things that are happening, and uh, the budget uh, team was a little bit behind in getting us the numbers for our capital update. So we're moving it to March and we'll give you a capital update in March. Yes. Yeah, and I'm fully aware this is a process that will probably get political and controversial. Um, it will definitely have to be handled by the city council, but I've spoken with Mayor Rogers. He's fully in support of removing the plaque, also is, is deeply offended. Um, so we've got our back on this. And uh, I, I know it's also not gonna be quick, but uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. So um, yeah, those were my future agenda items. Does anyone wanna add anything else for a future agenda item? Um, Steve, I thought you might have an idea. What idea might that be? Uh, I was told <laughs> you had a good idea and I wanted to give you credit for it. Um, about us giving our own updates. Oh, well, uh, thank you. It's just something that's uh, done in most board meetings, commissions, and city councils around the state, around the country. And um, it's, I think it's uh, going to work out quite nicely. 
You know, and, gives and everyone that, an opportunity to share things that they're thinking about in addition to putting things on future agendas. Uh, many times things don't make it to the agenda. And I think it's good for the public to also hear that their board members, commissioners, and city council folks are, you know, thinking beyond the agenda that's in front of them. I agree 100%. Great idea. Um, and you deserve credit. Uh, the city council does that. So we can model it after them. And uh, already spoken with staff about that. So I hope that'll start next month. Let's try to get that, that going pretty soon. Um, Terry, go ahead. Not a future agenda item specifically, but I'm just curious um, for Jen, has there been any discussion at the city about resuming in-person meetings um, in the near future? Um, not in particular. I know that there's been some guidance for us that we may start attending in-person meetings, but for the board itself, uh, we are still um, working on the technology to make a hybrid meeting happen. So that's where we're, the discussions have been around hybrid because this model works so well for members of the public that cannot physically be in attendance. They can attend this. It also gets recorded. So if they couldn't make the meeting, they can come back and look at it. So uh, we're looking at options for us to use technology in the location where we used to have our in-person meetings at Finley that is on schedule to be updated so that we can conduct hybrid meetings. Um, it's not moving as quickly as we had anticipated. Um, we thought it would be a little bit easier than it has been, but it's, it's moving forward. Um, but staff and um, others at the city are allowed to now attend meetings in person or meet people at sites, et cetera. So uh, we're starting to do that again and we're all back in the office. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, Terry, I, I, brought, I asked about that too. And um, I would love to see you all in person. I think it'll make our discussions better and more robust. I also wanna make sure that we still have a virtual format. So like Jen said, people have really gotten used to this in the last two years. I think engagement's increased and uh, gotten better personally. Um, and so I'm committed to us doing a hybrid format. Um, we can't do it in the council chambers. Uh, there's, there's more pressing business probably, but uh, maybe someday. Um, but Finley would be great. And thank you, Jen, for, for keeping the, the pedal to the metal on that one. Any other future agenda items that anyone would like to see? Okay, well, um, I hope I didn't mess up my first chair meeting too much. Uh, thank you, everyone. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the board uh, will be held on Wednesday, March 23rd, uh, at 4 p.m., still at 4 p.m. for now. Um, stay tuned for that change. And I'm gonna pick up my gavel again uh, <laughs> so I can actually bang the meeting out. And with that, I adjourn this meeting of the Board of Community Services at 6, 10 p.m. Thank you, everyone.